I have various, anything that's blue on my slide is a link to some documents. Uh, some of them are quite long. Uh, I have links later to some of the FCC rulings. So if you want to be reading that instead of my slides uh, or, or listening to me talk, I completely understand. The source code for my slides is also available, uh, but, uh, and, and they're probably typos, uh, but I, I, I always have typos on my slides because uh, I do just-in-time slide production. Uh, and people have a tendency to call out the typos. I know they're probably there. Just submit patches if you don't mind. So I'm a crazy free software zealot. Uh, I've never, uh, I never pretended not to be. Uh, I believe we should live in a world where all software is free software, and that's what I see myself as fighting for, for a living. So I see what I'm working on in free software as a movement for global social change to build a world where all software is free software. I expect it will not happen in my lifetime, uh, probably not in the lifetimes of anybody in this room, but that's the end goal in my view. Uh, the one thing I always point out when I give a talk about the GPL is to make it very clear that the copyleft and GPL as an implementation of copyleft is not a moral principle. These things, in my view, are moral principles. Copyleft is a tool. It is a strategy to attempt to advance the moral idea of software freedom. And I think people lose sight of that goal when they focus too much on the details of GPL compliance. I've spent much of my career focused on the details of GPL compliance, but I try never lose to lose sight of this very point. So I always throw this on a slide. You, you can just read it uh, or read it later. Um, I like to have formal definitions for things when I think about them. And I think this copied left definition, which originally comes from Wikipedia, which I've also contributed to, gives a sense of what copyleft is trying to do as a strategy and a tool. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about how this tool became such an important and integral part to the OpenWRT and LEAD communities over its existence, and in fact, in its very beginnings. The fact of the matter is the GPL is not some magic pixie dust that you sprinkle on your code and it magically makes it free software. Getting things to be free software requires sweat and effort. You actually have to fight for copyleft to succeed. You can't just use it and expect it to work by itself. That's why a process of enforcing the GPL exists. It is the process by which you make sure the copyleft is working correctly, and when someone fails to comply with the copyleft, you go and look at their products and use the tool of GPL to ensure that they are respecting the user's rights and freedoms and that users have equal rights, both commercially and non-commercially, to distribute and share and improve their software. Now, because copyleft is a, a tool, it's a tool that can be used wrong. You can use a screwdriver to stab somebody. You're using the screwdriver wrong when you do that. I'm just letting you know. Don't use the screwdriver that way. Use it to take screws off of your routers to take them apart. Uh, and similarly, you'll find people using the GPL in ways that aren't right. And that's why uh, in co collaboration with the Free Software Foundation, the organization I work for, Software Freedom Conservancy, published uh, these principles of enforcement to explain this is the way to use the GPL correctly to push forward that goal of software freedom. GPL violations are incredibly common. Uh, your community knows this, I'm gonna talk about in a minute, much better than most communities. The GPL has requirements to try to reach software freedom. It requires that the whole work be licensed under the GPL. And it means that everything added has to be under GPL compatible licenses when it's combined with a GPL work. And you have to get the complete corresponding source code to that work. That's a technically important thing. Most of you in the room probably understand this very well, that when you get a source release from a router manufacturer who's not particularly cooperative with the community, it may not actually build. That is not compliant with the GPL. The source code actually has to be usable for the thing it's supposed to be used for, building and installing onto the product that it originally lived on. And the GPL works by terminating when you fail to do these things you're supposed to do, the rights 
to distribute the software any, for, any further. And so GPL enforcement is this process of going to a company and saying, because you failed to comply with the GPL, because you failed to give the complete corresponding source code and the instructions on how to compile and build the software, you now don't have permission anymore under copyright to distribute your product, router, or whatever. And the only way you can get permission to distribute again is for the copyright holders to give it to you, and we're only going to give it back to you if you comply with the terms of the license as you originally had it. So why does all this relate to OpenWRT? In fact, OpenWRT is an example I've been using in my talks about GPL for probably six or seven years. And the reason why is because OpenWRT is the example that kept me going. I would have quit doing anything with copyleft enforcement if OpenWRT hadn't happened. It is the perfect example of how good outcomes come from doing GPL enforcement. And I'm so glad you all are still going because it keeps me going too. It all began in the spring of 2003. There were dozens of reports. I worked at the Free Software Foundation at the, at the time, where I used to work, about this product, the WRT54G, having inside it Linux and BusyBox and a number of other GPL programs. FSF immediately began discussions with, Link, with Cisco, who had bought Linksys just weeks before. It was literally like three weeks after the acquisition closed uh, that these reports started coming in. And one of the principles, if you go and read the principles link that I had, is to try to keep the negotiations confidential so the company isn't unduly embarrassed uh, for the violation. Your goal is to get them into compliance, not to shame them and have them leave the community and stop using GPL software. You want them to keep using it, but in compliance. Uh, unfortunately, the story became public because it was obvious to anyone who bought the router. It, it, at that point, it literally, I think, I think if you connected to the log file in the web interface, it had a, a clear Linux uh, syslog. So anybody who looked at it knew immediately there was Linux inside. So it was impossible to keep the story confidential. There's a slash dot story on that date that you can go and read. And that immediately made the negotiations much more difficult. The FSF, uh, at, at where I worked at the time, put together this coalition of copyright holders. It included Eric Anderson of the BusyBox Project, who I then, for many years later, worked with on GPL enforcement matters. It included Howard Velta. This was his first time ever doing GPL enforcement as well, uh, which he then later went on to do uh, more GPL enforcement than I think anybody in the world, and certainly more lawsuits than anybody in the world. Um, and I'll tell you how that story ended first. Uh, I'm, I, I just found, I didn't realize this was still on the OpenWRT website. I, I think that's wonderful uh, that that's up there. I, I didn't even know it was right there. Um, the first check-in of OpenWRT, I, I, uh, somebody said this morning the SVN is read-only, but I couldn't find it to check. But I remember distinctly back in 2004 checking out the revision one of OpenWRT and comparing it to the source release that we had reviewed from this GPL enforcement action and seeing that it was basically bite for bite the same. I was really excited by that, that, that we had done something, gotten source code release that had then launched uh, a free software project. It was not easy uh, because, as I mentioned, Cisco had just purchased Linksys. Uh, they were really surprised. Linksys had never mentioned during the acquisition process that there was obligations uh, under GPL in any of the products that Cisco had now acquired, uh, and they had absolutely no plan uh, for GPL compliance whatsoever. Uh, they had never even thought about it. We did a number of months of negotiation, and eventually Linksys said, well, actually what happened is we sourced this thing from Broadcom, they just handed us a board, we put it in the router, we didn't know anything about it. Now, I know there's probably Broadcom people in the, uh, in the audience, and I want to be clear, it was a very different Broadcom. If you Google for news stories about Broadcom of the 2003 era, that you find some things that are, frankly, probably violate the code of conduct uh, of this conference. So this is a very different Broadcom run by very different people, uh, and they weren't particularly easy to deal with. I discovered this morning, in fact, it was 13 years ago today. That date, I checked my email for, and my calendar, that's the date I sat down across the table from the Broadcom executives, whom they f flew like half their executive team out to New York uh, where, where we, we had the meeting, to have the meeting with us. We came to this deal at that meeting. We agreed to look the other way on the fact that they had a proprietary 
device driver because their argument was the FCC will not allow us to ever put this driver as part of Linux because it can't be released as source code because that's not allowed, et cetera. And we, we took that on, on faith. We, we didn't verify it. We said, okay, but you've got to come into compliance on everything else but that. And they did, in fact. We made that deal and they came into compliance and that's what became the first check-in of OpenWRT. Now, most of my work these days in GPL enforcement is dealing with proprietary Linux modules. It is a big deal in GPL enforcement and it is a widely violated issue uh, in the Linux community and I work with the coalition of Linux developers who enforce the conservancy almost, almost very much on that issue. So I've always wondered, did I make the right deal? Should, should we have made the deal to say, leave that, leave that proprietary, we won't sue you over that Linux module? But even if I could go back and change it, I don't think I would, because I'd never want to mess with the idea that this generated the OpenWIT project. Who knows what could have happened if we had refused that deal that day. I might not be here exactly 13 years later talking to this huge community of people developing a very important project for the future of not just software freedom, but internet access freedom and wireless freedom. And I'm also convinced that time travel in the past is impossible. They say you can put these wormhole, you can like, if they created, if somebody created a wormhole 13 years ago, like maybe there'd be another end to that wormhole today I could go through, but I, I don't, I don't know if I, I don't think it's true. I don't think you can travel back into the past. But the interesting thing I think that's happened is, is I find the OpenWRT and lead communities, uh, they have a culture of understanding GPL enforcement. There, there are, I can go to other rooms of this, uh, this parallel conference going on and not get such a good reception about GPL enforcement, but I never worry about that in this community because I think everyone in this community understands that it's part of the DNA of, of what happened in the project. It's how the project came to be. And I think the developers that I've met have a real healthy distrust of proprietary components and proprietary device drivers. And I'm a, I'm a really big fan of that and glad that that culture is here. And I think your community has not been afraid to confront companies and say, you, you can't have this proprietary device driver. We're not going to accept it into our project. Uh, we are, we're going to try to rewrite it if we can. If we can't, we're going to focus on uh, other platforms that don't have proprietary drivers. And I also think it's wonderful how much, I mean, the, the number of times I've heard Ath9K mentioned at this conference, I think is wonderful. Um, I, the fact that you all really loud, loud and, and cheer for the, the companies that release stuff fully as free software uh, is great. Um, now you should ask me sometime to tell you the story about Ath5K, because I could give a, a two hour talk on, on the whole Ath5K thing. But uh, the, the Ath9K thing that, that uh, many people, uh, Kathy and Luis Rodriguez and all sorts of other people got done is really important. And that's thanks to efforts by this community to demand it. So uh, I think your argument with companies is absolutely correct. It's absolutely the right first step for GPL compliance. Telling people we want you to be an upstream, we want you to be part of our upstream, is really a GPL compliance effort. It's a first friendly step. It should be friendly to start. You should never get a heated discussion in GPL compliance until you're years into the process. The initial discussion should be, hey, work with us upstream. It'll be better for you, better for your product, better for us, we'll help you maintain it. And I think that's given you a great power to influence the wireless industry behavior uh, in ways that I don't see paralleled in any other embedded device world. This, this is not happening in the television world. It's not happening in any of those other embedded devices. Wireless routers are unique because of this community. And if you continue to let companies know, hey, proprietary device drivers violate the GPL, so don't do them. And we're not gonna work with you anyway for technical reasons, but you also don't wanna bring that risk to us or bring that risk to yourselves. This is all part of the way the GPL tool works for the OpenWRT and lead communities. So, there's a lot's changed in the last 13 years, um, but very little has changed. We still have what is clear, what clear to me in 2003, a shared problem that is now still our shared problem, this misunderstanding by the FCC in the United States and other regulators around the world about wireless devices and what to do about them in the marketplace. 
Now, I thought we had solved this problem. I, in the later years after this enforcement action, I also did some work uh, when there was a, a weird NPRM about wireless stuff in early 2007, and we won that fight. Th that ruling basically says, well, open source might have a higher burden uh, it, it, when we analyze devices, but we still know a specific reason you can't open source wireless stuff. Uh, I don't think Ath9K could have happened if not for that ruling. That ruling was the thing that got the Atheros legal folks to say, you know what, we can, we can open source all this stuff. The, the FCC says we pass a high burden, but, but it's not impossible, so let's just do it. Um, and I really want to thank, so, so, so Eric's gotten a couple rounds of applause, but I asked for another one for him for being the one that no, gave us the bad news. People deserve to be thanked for giving us important bad news. Thank you, Eric, for being the first person to say, hey, the FCC has revisited that thing. Can I, can I hear a round of applause, Eric, for that? <laughs> and it took him like two months to convince me to even pay attention. I was like, no, man, I see you're all confused. I solved this back in 2007, man. I, I'm, I was all over that. It's done. He's like, no, 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 it's new. It's back. Uh, and he was absolutely right. But we need to be clear on a very important point. It's an open question. I, I feel like everyone's got this feeling, oh, we lost with the FCC. Oh my gosh, well now we're going to have to design lockdown hardware. We have to do it. We don't have a choice. I don't think we're there yet. And I don't think we should offer a compromise before the negotiation with the FCC to figure out what to do. We should be working with them. I, I've heard the good news from Eric uh, that, that he's going to be able to work with them even more closely. This is really great and we need to do that. Now meanwhile, can the GPL do something to help here? So I've been thinking about this question since Eric finally convinced me there was a problem. I was like, well, is the GPL involved? So I thought about this back then too. How, do we, how does this thing interact? Well, what we actually have, at least in the United States, is we have two federally controlled legal systems in the US at war with each other. Copyright, which governs software, and the GPL is a copyright license, well, it has certain requirements that you have to meet. And meanwhile, the FCC has certain requirements that they're considering setting and explaining how to meet. And it could be the case if they say, for example, which they've never said, by the way, yet, you can't have GPL device drivers for wireless cards or you can't have any free software controlling the wireless card. Uh, that will then be in conflict with the copyright requirements. So I think we actually have to, or we may have to, I don't know if we have to yet, but one of the strategies we may need to employ is to force the US federal government to consider the fact that it's now got two different legal systems in opposition with each other that have to be reconciled. And while we should do the, the rulemaking dance, we should serve on the committees and talk to them and comment on all the rulemakings they make, there might be another approach we can do in parallel. And this is a new idea, it's half-baked, so I'm leaving a lot of time for questions so you can tell me that it's foolish. I think it's one of these ideas that's either brilliant or completely foolish. It's not a mediocre idea, I know that. It's crazy or it's really brilliant. But what if we took a product in front of the FCC that was fully GPL'd and said, we want you to certify this? Now, either they'll certify it as compliant, in which case we've now got precedent that you can certify a device that's fully GPL top to bottom, uh, and it can be okay to have a wireless device that is driven and controlled that way. Or they reject it and say, we won't certify this because it's free software. That would allow us to directly ask the question to the federal government, why are you contradicting yourself? Why are you saying under copyright rules, you know, we built the product on this software, you're saying we have to violate the GPL to make our, our product compliant, that's a contradiction. We want the federal government to give an answer to that contradiction. We can ask. In fact, in the United States, we have this weird thing. You can sue your government in the US. So we can sue the government if we have to to make them answer that question. Now, this could be a really bad idea, I admit. But it could be a really good idea. So we're going to be, Conservancy is going to be investigating whether that's a, a, a parallel strategy we can use to deal with this FCC question. I think it would, might make a big impact, and it is again a place where OpenWT can be, and LEAD can be a big part of. So I'm going to leave there last, my last five minutes just for questions, because, you know, I always say crazy radical things that people like to ask questions about, so. Mm -hmm. 
Do we have any questions? Yeah. Um, could you perhaps talk about how you can still um, uh, 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 be compliant with the GPL if you're trying to build a, a router that has uh, secure boot uh, technologies and you don't want or you can't allow other people to build? So, so the, there's a there's a couple a couple of um, trajectories of that question. Uh, so one is that if it's using secure boot truly as a security mechanism, not as a uh, a user control mechanism, i.e., you're giving all the keys to the user, then there's nothing in either GPL v2 or GPL v3 that says you can't do that. Um, in fact, I wish I could put on my laptop a, a secured boot chain that I built myself and signed the binaries myself with my own keys so that I know with my laptop sitting in a hotel room, did someone change it when I come back to it? Um, th that type of secure boot, absolutely no problem under the GPL. Uh, now, the question is, can you lock down a device? Uh, that's an open question. Um, some pundits have said GPLv2 allows you to lock down the, the device such that the user can't install a modified version of the software, and GPLv3 prohibits it. It's not that clear to me. It never has been. I, th I see GPLv3's rules in this regard as a clarification of the rules already in GPLv2. So I think that's a question that is open, um, but I don't think we should jump to that. I don't think we should have products that users can't upgrade. Now, one interesting thing that's true that I often tell people about this, under both V2 and V3, the requirements of the license refer to the GPL software. It's one of the reasons you'll never hear me say the phrase anti-TiVoization clause about GPL V3. The reason is, is that GP, uh, uh, TiVo today would be compliant with a GPL V3 if Linux were GPL V3. The reason is, is that you're absolutely permitted to recompile all the software for a TiVo and reinstall it. If you do so, all of the proprietary software on the TiVo, the stuff that actually talks to their network and puts up their interface and all that, will cease to work because it checks the checksum and the secure boot line to the proprietary software. So the whole goal is this is to make the free software work. So in a theoretical example, and I'm, I'm somewhat afraid to give you this example because I don't want people to actually use it, but you could lock down a device such that you had your proprietary web interface on an open WRT router, and if after the upgrade the user did by modifying their version of Linux, the only thing you did was force the web interface and all the other non-GPL proprietary software running in user land to cease working when they did that, it would likely be compliant. Um, and that's basically what TiVo does. So I don't want to see people doing that because I think it's bad policy for software freedom, but I don't necessarily see prima facie a compliance uh, problem there. I think, may, do I have time for one more question? Uh, we're out of time, but maybe if we okay. have one small question. Okay, and we have a break now, so, oh, go ahead. Yeah, maybe a, a clarification on that. In the secure boot uh, situation, it's actually that the system will not boot. The image is digitally signed, so you can recompile the software, but it will not boot. You cannot install it. It's not just that the uh, proprietary software won't, won't run. Even the, the open source GPL software won't run. I, I, is that, you're saying that's true on TiVo, for exa as an example? I don't know about TiVo, but I know it's true on our product. If it's true on your product, that may be a GPL violation, right? Because the GPL requires, GPL v2 even requires the scripts used to control compilation and installation. If the user can't, if you don't give the users the scripts used to install, you might have a problem. Now, as I said, some pundits have argued that crypto lockdown uh, is not intended in these scripts used to install, i.e., GPL v2, when it says scripts used to install, does not mean you have to include the encryption keys. Uh, I think that's a debatable question. Uh, I, I'm not t necessarily taking a position either, either side, but I think you should pay attention to that clause of GPL v2 before you lock down a device. Time for a quick follow-up question, or should I? Uh, <laughs> I'll be around during the break if you want to follow so, up. Uh, Maybe uh, very quickly, you said that uh, a user should always be able to upgrade his device. Um, what if that is a, uh, a health service or a security application where, which actually if the user or in more likely an external hacker would change it could, could cause uh, severe problems? Is that not a use case in which you could argue that a, secure, a lockdown device is a better choice than uh, a device that's hackable? 
The device should be under the control of the user. I, I would refer you to my colleague Karen Sandler's talks about her medical device on her body, which she doesn't have the source code to, she can't modify and she can't reinstall. What should really be the case is she should be the one who decided which checksum of software she's running on her medical device and no one else should be able to change that. Uh, in the case of a medical device in a hospital, the hospital staff should be in control of that, right? They're the user in that case, and the user should be in control of the secured boot chain, not the manufacturer. Karen's talked a great deal about how we can't trust these medical uh, manufacturers to necessarily do the right thing, necessarily fix bugs, and the FDA doesn't even review the source code at all of medical devices. So I think it, in that case, we want to look to who the user is, and the user should be the one in control. Now, that's a policy answer, not a copyleft answer. Copyleft's, again, a tool trying to implement certain policies, and we can debate whether the tool succeeds or fails on whatever policy we agree is the right policy for free software. So, so the user of a medical, medical device would be, for example, the hospital, the user of a uh, like a embedded firmware from, on a ra railroad crossing would be the railroad company, not anybody else. I, I mean, I, I'd, I'd want to look through every example, but I think we should look at, at, who, at who the user is in each case. Um, I, I don't, given that we're out of time, I don't think we should go through every example and decide it, but I'd be happy to talk to you about it later. Okay, thank you.